Welcome everyone to another episode of Pop Rant Radio, the podcast where two pop culture junkies discuss popular and sometimes not so popular culture. My name is Moss, I'm one of your hosts, and with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Eric. How are you today, sir? I'm pretty good. Good. Yes. Just got done seeing Ghostbusters. Oh yeah? What'd you think? I liked it. I would give it one ghostly thumb up. (laughs) A ghostly thumb? Yeah. And I give Legend of Tarzan... Two missed opportunities down. <laughs> that's a that's a convoluted rating system, my friend. Yeah. You know what's funny? I was thinking about Legend of Tarzan and Legend of Hercules. Both really missed the idea of the legend part. What if they took all of the characters? What if they put, put like, Hercules and Tarzan and, like, Dracula and, like, all <laughs> the... Like, the universal all, monsters? Yeah, all, like, the... Well, these yeah, movies... I know it wasn't Legend of Dracula. It was, like, Dracula untold. the beginning or something. It was Dracula Untold. Sure. What if they took all these bad movies and just put them all together and said, hey, let's see what happens? The Legend of the Secret of Nim. <laughs> <laughs> it's all of them and then it's Nim. Little mouse. Ah, so today we're going to talk about something that's really, really important. In the last full episode, we talked a lot about tone as we were going through and talking about different different mm-hmm. movies. Yeah, we did. Okay. We, we mentioned tone like four or five times really? in that episode. Yeah. Foreshadow. So, so I figured we'd do an episode on tone and why tone is so important and what is tone and yeah. <laughs> why it's important. And why it's important. Again, still. Yes. It's so important, it's mentioned twice. And Hollywood, listen, because you screw it up a lot. So what do we mean by tone? And for lack of a better definition, I guess, because we didn't... For lack of a better tone? (laughs) No, for lack of a better definition, because we didn't look this up ahead of time, I guess, what the dictionary definition is, but no, I see you going for your phone. (laughs) We, I think we kind of agreed that ultimately it's the vibe. Yeah. Like the feeling. It's the tone of the movie. Yeah, the atmosphere that you get out of the movie. Yeah, the tone is the tone. Right. Really. That's the best definition. That's the best definition. You ever seen Lucky Number Slevin? Yes. That's great. Did everyone ever tell you not to use the word that you're defining in the definition? (laughs) Uh, I really like that movie a lot. It's not a perfect movie. but (laughs) It's got Ben Kingsley, Morgan Morgan Freeman, Freeman, Josh Hartnett, and Bruce Bruce Willis. Willis, and Lucy Liu. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people in that movie. It's good for the Kevin Bacon game. It is. Even though he's not in it. He's in everything. He's in everything else. So what do we mean by tone? Well, we're going to give a couple of examples. So like starting off, like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. You know, the first Indiana Jones movie really kind of when as soon as you get into that movie, you know, you get the Paramount logo and it fades into the mountains and you're in the jungle. Yep. And then we get the scene with the giant rolling boulder and you really get the sense that we're in a 1930s like serialized kind of mystery thriller like that's the tone that's the vibe that you really got from that movie right or like the rocketeer where it's very much sets up as like this classic comic book storyline of yeah. good versus evil yeah it's you know it's the good guys versus the nazis and the rocketeer specifically you know it's kind of it's kind of comic booky but it's not yeah. it's not over the top like it's it's not super gritty realism it's a little over the top but yeah it's a little well, the over the top looks like frankenstein but monster. it's not like you know it's not like crazy physics where like guys are getting punched and fly 20 right. feet in the air or anything you know in in the rocketeer or in raiders of the lost ark within the first 5 10 minutes of the movie you know the kind of movie that you're watching right like you get a sense of what's going to happen in the film and kind of what the rules quote unquote for this movie watching experience is going to be and that's really important it's really important in films to establish the tone and the atmosphere of your movie fairly early on so that audiences kind of know what to expect right and it's especially important to kind of stick to it we are going to go over i'm going to especially go over an example of a movie that doesn't stick to it me too and yeah for some people's experience, that goes to its detriment. For others, it goes to its benefit. But it's there is a shift, and then there is breaking. Mm-hmm. A shift is when the film completely changes its tone and sticks to a new one. A breaking is, for example, the Transformers movies, where it's supposed to be like this serious you know, family action film, and then John Turturro says he's under the robot's testicles. <laughs> like... It, it breaks, or we have two racist robots. Like, right. It that's that breaks tone. A lack of a lack of consistency for sure, and kind of like you said, it, it is important to kind of be consistent. But as you said again, you can shift the tone. Right. As long as you've set the film up to be okay with that, and for the audience to be to ready make, for it, it needs to make sense. It does need to make sense in the context of the film. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Like, why is tone so important? 
we're going to go in and give some examples that we really feel best represent why tone is so important in film. And uh, you want to go first? This is where we point at each other until one of us starts <laughs> to go. Uh, sure, I can go first. Cool. So you might as well go over to the, the chalkboard behind you and erase the number of day, number of podcast episodes we haven't talked about David Fincher. <laughs> you can erase it and put it back down to zero. So the first movie that I think really nails its tone is David Fincher's Seven. For sure. Seven is kind of a dark murder mystery where the killer follows the seven deadly sins while he murders his victims. Mm -hmm. It's the classic what's in the box movie. What's in the box. Yep. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman. It's fantastic. Spoilers. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman. (laughs) And someone. I'll bleep it out. (laughs) It'll be funny. (laughs) But really, the best thing about Seven is its, its tone. And it's just this disgusting, like, grimy, just like this dirty feeling throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Especially when you get to, like, the crime scenes and, like, the tone just shines. Yeah. And I've used this word before a lot of times, usually in relation to Fincher. But, like, I think grotesque is yeah. really the appropriate word to describe it. Because even from, like, even right before the movie begins, we get, like, the title sequence where it's all of like the the scrawled messages and what we eventually find out is the killer's notebooks. Right. You know, and it shows him like with the razor like kind of filing off his his, his fingerprints. fingerprints. And like again, from the very, very get go, you realize, okay, this is gonna be a serious, dark toned movie. Right. But it's not it's not scary. It's not like frightening. No, it's, it's more just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, it's it's so it's creepy. It goes beyond creepy and really delves in the realm of uncomfortable. That's a really great word to describe it. Yeah, and it's just it's like it's he and Fincher is really really good at getting this vibe. He, mm-hmm. he gets it really well on Gone Girl. Yeah, uh, he gets it fairly well at times in Zodiac. Yeah, and like you you've said this before, Fincher is the kind of director that's willing to go two steps beyond oh, yeah. or even more what most other filmmakers are willing to do. And that's, that's kind of his calling card. Like, it's a real signature for all of his films. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the most tame murder is, like, the second one. And it's even screwed up. The first yeah. one's disgusting. Some of them are just, like, ugh, Like, you can't even think about it because it makes you, like, cringe. Yeah, they're very, very disturbing. And, like, right. even though it's a movie, you know, he really sells home the fact that this these are terrible, terrible things that happen to these characters. And because you get to see these terrible things through the eyes of these two detectives right who are both themselves coming from two different places you know morgan freeman's character has been in the game for a long time and yeah, he's worked in the city for a long time from retirement. exactly and then brad pitt is like new on this particular force and on this case yeah, and he's kind of the hothead and he's very brash and yeah everything. exactly as you go through and see all the different crime scenes with all the different bodies that are right. based around the seven deadly sins. And as the mystery unfolds. Yes. Like you really delve and you really are immersed in this world that Fincher has created. And that is all thanks to the atmosphere and the tone yeah. that he sets up beautifully. And it just carries through all the way until the last shot and the last line of the movie. Yep which I won't spoil anything, but Morgan Freeman's the last line in the movie, he's quoting a poem where it basically says something to the effect of the world's a beautiful place and it's worth fighting for. And Morgan Freeman says, well, I I agree with the second part. Like it's worth fighting for, but as this movie has shown, it's the world's beautiful, right? The world can be a very, very ugly place. Yeah. And the really nice thing about this is even in like scenes where we're supposed to calm down, because like if you keep on throwing stuff at us, which is, kind of what a lot of horror movies don't understand is you have to give people moments to breathe yes because it makes your stuff more effective this movie's like breathing points are like there's a there's a nice dinner where brad pitt and his fiance or i think it's his wife it's his wife um gwyneth paltrow yeah they both invite morgan freeman over for dinner and like even his apartment is kind of trashy it's Mm -hmm. near a it's near a subway line yeah they just moved in and so, like, the train keeps on going by, and, like, their house rattles, and it's, it's not a good place. Right. It's a nice scene, and there's even a laugh where when they make the realization that, you know, the subway's going by, like, Morgan Freeman starts laughing. It's it's comedic, and it's still uncomfortable at the same time. Right. Yeah. Because, like, you, uh, you're a guest, and this is kind of strange. Right. Something a little bit more modern that I think uh, someone who has kind of all of a sudden come on my, my radar is a, a director by the name of Jeremy Solnier. I can't remember was how you pronounce his last name. Recently just directed the film Green Room. And he I had seen his movie Blue Ruin, which was a movie of his, I think, two years ago. And both films are very much like David Fincher's. 
They're very grotesque. They're very intense. Green Room especially, there's a lot of murder in that where it doesn't cut away from it. Like, you see stuff happening. Mm-hmm. And, like, to a lot of people, they would, like, you know, would write it off as just, you know, like a gore fest or anything like that. But it doesn't feel like a gore fest, whereas, like, you know, you know it's, it's a watermelon instead of someone's head. Yeah. You feel like this is someone just gushing and it's just disgusting right and that's and that's something that fincher has always been really good at is that you know in a lot of movies you'll get you'll get a cutaway from the violence and the implied violence can even be more effective than showing it right and there's movies like you were just saying that are that can be over the top where they show the violence and it's almost comical it, it has less of an effect than right. if you and didn't show not, it it's not like that in these movies right in the movies you just mentioned it's not but or nor in fincher's but and, and I can't speak to those movies. I'm writing them down so I can watch them later because I haven't seen either yeah, well, one. Just, you got to be in the mood for them because sure. they are intense. But that's what Fincher does so well is he finds that balance of showing you all the atrocities and having it have that impact without coming off like, oh, I'm watching a movie. Right. Like it comes off as this is disturbing and this is this is uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. But it's that uncomfortableness that really immerses you in the story, and that's all thanks to the tone that he set up. All of the, the from the images to the sound cho- design right. to the just the dialogue and, and the the way that the characters talk to each other, and you know just the city itself being this dreary like rain filth covered yeah. you know just metropolis. It's like it's like a, like a like a Hell's Kitchen, New York. Yeah, exactly, piece. exactly. And never breaking from that, even even in those scenes where you get a little bit of comedy and you get a little bit of levity, because levity is important. It's right. important not to just bog your film down with. These are terrible things that are happening to the characters all the time, because like you said, we the audience needs room to breathe yep. because it makes those terrible moments truly terrifying because you you've had a little bit of a reprieve and it makes those moments all that much more and effective. It, it allows you to lower your guard. And yes. that's when it hits you the hardest. And Fincher is a master yes. at making you lower your guard. And then just taking full advantage of it. Yeah. And I, and I agree. I think Seven is probably one of the greatest. I mean, all of his films represent this. Yeah. Even, you know, we were talking the other week about Alien 3. And Alien 3 is not a great movie by any means. But even in that movie, one of, you know, his earliest Hollywood film... You can see that's really what he was going for, and I, I think I agree with you that Seven really encompasses what he tends to do as a director when it comes to tone. Right, that's what I call a shower flick. It's a movie <laughs> that you watch and you go and you take a shower when you're done, and you kind of cry there for a second. Very nice for everything. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's great because his tone in the in Seven is kind of a hard tone to grasp because so many people can try it and it feels synthetic and it feels faked or it feels like. He's trying too hard, which we'll talk about trying too hard later on the podcast. <laughs> but his he just he never feels like he's trying too hard. He feels like he's just nailing it. Yes. He's, constantly. Yes. Just constantly without fail, nailing it. Yes. Without fail, he's nailing it. Well, Panic Room sucks. But and, well, and Benjamin Button doesn't really have that gross feel to it either. No, but. it's it but it's dip, that's not what he's going for. Right. Like he's no. going for something else. Can you imagine Benjamin Button with like a like a what's in the box kind of scene or <laughs> or like a girl with a dragon tattoo rape scene in it? It just I've, be rough. Be rough. Ruin that I actually like Benjamin Button. I know most people don't like that movie. I don't think it's one of his stronger movies, but I but I still like it. It's very like Jim Carrey in Twenty Three. Yeah. Okay. Like it's it's kind of like a character break. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Definitely. So the first movie I want to talk about today is Mad Max Fury Road. Fury Road. And don't you, don't you mean feminist road? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So Mad Max Fury Road, this is a movie that when I went to see, I kind of wasn't expecting a whole lot. Like I, I saw Neither the tra- I. I saw the trailers and I was like, oh, this is kind of exciting. Like I'm not, I've seen the other Mad Max movies, but I was never a huge fan of them. Like I kind of appreciated them from a filmmaking perspective, oh, yeah. but they're not what I would call great, you know, cinematic masterpieces. How dare you? And Thunderdome so, is amazing. So when I go, yeah. So <laughs> when I go to, when I went to see Fury Road, I was kind of like, all right, you know, I'm just... Let's let's see what happens. And I ended up loving Fury Road. Yeah, and I think the funniest thing about Fury Road is it, it literally feels like they just stick an IV in you. Yeah. Of like straight cocaine. And That's, then you sit down for two and a half hours right. and you get up and you leave. So from yeah, from the opening shot, it's Max, you know, standing there and he's taking a leak and the two headed lizard rolls up and he steps on it and you know, we get the opening of My Name is Max mm-hmm. and my world is fire and blood. And then we get this 
this car chase and the car flips over and just right off the bat you notice this is this world is dirty yeah. you know there's sand and it gets everywhere we'll talk more about that in a minute <laughs> but so uh people can guess what we're talking yeah. about yeah <laughs> so it just it gets it's a very it's a very it's gritty but in a different way it's gritty right. in that there's there's dirt and there's grime everywhere not in like a nasty or disgusting or uncomfortable way but just in a this world is a lived in post apocalyptic like desert yeah, it's a world desert. yeah it's exactly this exactly what it is and everything is you know sand and motor oil and grease and bullets and, and bullets and ammunition and brass yeah exactly and right from the get go max gets captured he gets branded or he's about to be branded they tattoo like his blood type and the information about him because they're going to use him as an iv drip essentially yep. and it's a blood bag right and he he escapes and he's running through these halls and you see you know all these guys and they're in they have white you know paint or whatever all over them white powder all over them and they all have tattoos and like scars in their face and they're chasing him and it's it's this very almost like hellish run through this cavern right. and you know as he emerges he pushes open the doors and the sunlight fades in and it's like whoa and he hasn't it's like he hasn't seen sunlight in forever you know they, they bring him back in and then boom you get the title mad max fury road and this giant huge i don't know like uh it's almost like the the front of you know, the grill of a car like just right. slams into the screen and has the title and from the get-go you you know this movie is going to be a for lack of a better term, a high octane thrill ride, essentially. Right. I think the 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 true testament to this movie, is, as far as its tone and the atmosphere that it establishes, is once the bad guys start chasing after Max and Furiosa. Slight spoilers for the first twenty minutes of this movie. Yep. You you get the guy playing the guitar on the giant truck yes. that's just all amplifiers with giant bass drums behind yes. it, and it works. Yeah. And you're not like, this is stupid. It's like, a guy in a red onesie with a bandana over his eyes yeah. playing a double, I think it's like a double or single neck guitar. Yeah, and it's just, and he's, he's going crazy on it and, you know, fire's coming out of the guitar and the the tone that they have established for this movie, that all works. Yeah. There's a guy playing a guitar with fire shooting out of it on a giant truck made of amplifiers mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm okay with this. Well, this, I, this isn't too ridiculous. I love how they introduce like the religion of this world too. Yes. Where it's clearly Valhalla or, you know, Norse expi Norse inspired yeah, religion. Yeah, it's very Norse Viking inspired. It's, uh, you know, witness me in Valhalla, but I love the whole like witness me. I love the idea of like chrome. Yes, and the like, chrome, chrome spray. spray. Yes. So whenever like it, it's noble for them to give their lives for the... Immortan Joe? I thought it was uh, Immortal Joe. It's Immortan Joe. Yeah. If they give their lives for him, that's noble. They get into Valhalla with him when he dies. Right. So they for them to do it, they spray Chrome on and yeah. they just go, they kill themselves and it's yeah, and there's even amazing. like there's that one sh there's that one guy in the very beginning that like sprays the chrome and he takes the spear that has the grenade on the end of it. He doubles and he just jumps off and he lands on the car yeah. and blows himself up and it's just. Again, this It's crazy. It is it's crazy, but it works. Yeah. Because the movie from the very get go shows you this world is fire and blood. Yeah. This world is insane. It's crazy. It's something out of like a I don't know, like a like a fallout or Yeah, but I'm even thinking like um I forget the guy who who wrote all the the Conan the Barbarian comics. Oh, okay. But it's something it's like something that he like would a John do. John Carpenter. Yeah, kind of or like a John Carpenter type thing where it's it's this insanity but it's all contained in a world where right. that insanity is believable. And you buy it the whole time. You do. You buy it. Like I think I think the only the only flaw in the tone of this movie, there's one shot and it's towards the very end where again slight spoilers where the guy who's playing the guitar like he gets the the truck like crashes or whatever and the guitar like flies towards the camera and then flies back on like the little elastic band or whatever. That and it's like totally CG and it's like it's a little cartoony. Right. That ah, oh, that one moment. But outside of that, the entire movie is just this this dirty, sand covered, grease covered, you know, world of of cars and fire and just insanity. Yep. And I, I think the the point that you brought up, up about the religion and them wanting to ascend to Valhalla after they die in service to a Morton Joe. 
like that really plays into the idea that this guy has convinced this entire civilization of yeah. people that he's a god. It shows this crazy dedication to him where they're willing to give their lives to this horrible person yeah. and he, willy-nilly about everything. And even beyond that, you know, in the beginning when all of the all of the guys, they have to go and like grab the steering wheels and there's like that shrine built to steering wheels right. and they have to like choose their weapon, they choose their steering wheel to put into the car and it's like there's been this development of a religion that worships motor vehicles, that essentially right. worships gasoline. Like gasoline. Gasoline. Like gasoline is the is the most valuable resource alongside water, and Immortan Joe controls the water and right. the gasoline, so he essentially is God in this universe. And the the craziness of his image, and we even get the behind the scenes like He's clearly sick and he's clearly dying, but they, yeah, they he dress has like him a up. And yeah, yeah. So but they paint his respirator with like giant teeth on it, so it looks intense. Right. And... So even this this godlike character, he has something to hide, and he has to cover up the fact that he isn't this greater being, but no one else can know that. And that that whole idea carries through. We get the guy who has, you know, he has like elephantitis and he has the growths on the bottom and yeah. the, and his nipples pierced and like everything's just crazy. Like everything is just insane in this movie, but it works. Where the guitar player is one of the most tame right. things in the movie. It's just everything from, from the moment the movie opens, you know, I am in this nightmarish, hellish desert world yeah. and everything that you see from there on in fits within that world and that's all thanks to the tone that's set up in those first few minutes of the movie and it never wavers with the exception of that one stupid shot with a guitar right and it works and it works that was fun <laughs> Ooh, it was really i really really like that movie i was surprised by how good it was i i was too man plus nicholas holt's character like has like a really good arc yeah admits like this crazy movie which was good too yeah and then that 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 moment where Max and Furiosa are wrestling over the gun, mm -hmm. and then he finally gets it and he just goes boom, 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 like around her head, and you're yeah. just like, "Fuck, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah." He I'm just stopping. he unloads the clip like, around her yeah, head, and it, he's like, "We're gonna stop." Now. Right, like everybody in the scene is just like, "Okay, you're you're serious. We're we're stopping." Like again, just it just carries on that whole idea of this world is crazy and the people in it are crazy. Right. And like I just I love the fact that that whole the choreography of that scene yes is super smooth it's not shaky it's not cutty it's like very like very it holds on them yes. it holds on angles it's such a good movie it's I really love really that well. movie it, it won like six Oscars I know it was deservedly so yeah. like that movie was so great all right so our next film is Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket now this movie is infamous for its tonal shift in fact it has such a strong tonal shift that a lot of people consider it two different movies. Yeah, and I'm going to be up front. I've actually never seen Full Metal Which Jacket. Which is a problem. <laughs> I know. But uh, I've seen I've seen parts of it. I've seen a lot of the the first half. Right. But I've never watched the full thing. So you're going to you're going to take the wheel on this and Absolutely. I'll I'll comment if I feel comfortable doing so. <laughs> so the movie it takes place during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. But the first half is the boot camp for our kind of our main characters. I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't really feel like there's a main character in this. It feels like we're watching an ensemble mm -hmm. move through events. So the first tone is a boot camp where it's kind of comedic, but kind of like dark comedy. As we have the famous drill sergeant, who was actually a marine sergeant that Stanley Kubrick brought on to coach his actor, and then said, "You know what? Screw it. You're going to be the actor now." <laughs> Sounds like a very Kubrick thing to do. Oh yeah, and it, it works amazingly well. It's this horrible drill sergeant coming down on all these soldiers, but specifically uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's character, <laughs> uh, Private Piles, who is a bit of an obese soldier who's kind of like, uh, you kind of can tell he doesn't want to be here. He's probably here for a very specific reason that's not to join the military. And like I said, the tone is kind of light. It's it's kind of more lighthearted. You're, you're kind of supposed to laugh as the drill sergeant makes fun of Piles, you know, uh, he's got a bunch of like horrible degrading lines that are either, you know, like they're homophobic or they're racist or something like that, but it's acceptable that, now. Those things happened. And then there's a big shift where, spoiler alert for an over 30 year old movie, <laughs> Piles goes crazy and he kills both the drill sergeant and himself. And that is like, that's a pretty big shift. It's almost a tonal break, I would say, because, you know, we go from lighthearted, dark comedy to... Well, shit, someone's dead now. Right. And then we jump to Vietnam. 
And Kubrick does a very good job of handling Vietnam in a way where it's like, hey, we're telling a story, but it's a story about Vietnam where they'll be talking, there'll be a group of people talking, talking, and then one of them will just randomly get shot in the head and they have to scramble for cover and try to figure out where the shot came from. And it's just this really good, like, picture of how these soldiers' lives work. Yeah, it becomes very visceral. Yeah, very much so. Kind of like, uh, like the deer hunter. The deer hunter does a really good job with it, too, of just how intense life over there was. Mm -hmm. How, you know, a downtime could be a downtime for a day or a night where they could sleep somewhere, or it could be a downtime for five minutes, someone could find them, and they have to go scurry to find another spot to hide or stay there and fight or do whatever. It was a re He has a really, really good job of getting a really good grasp of you know how war was and how these soldiers' lives took place. Right, and it sounds like you, you as the audience feel that intensity the entire time. Like yeah. You've been set up to not know exactly what to expect. You've gone from the first half of the movie where you're introduced to these characters and it, even though it's dark, it has this comedic element to now you're in this world of what's going to happen next. Right. And it's it, it sticks with it. And that's the, that's the big thing why it's okay with me. A lot of people don't like this shift. A lot of people joke about watching the movie to about the hour and a half point and then switching it off because that's the end of the drill sergeant portion. And that is arguably, and I do agree, it is the stronger portion of the two. But I, I like the shift because it's it's strong. Both cases are very, very strong. And I argue that the second half of Full Metal Jacket is one of the best like representations of war that I think we've gotten in a long time. I've, but it's just he's, he's really really good at as a military veteran yourself, right. you would as a decorated veteran of the <laughs> Marine Corps. But no, he does a really really good job of just capturing like the uncertainty and the you know the tension and the nervousness of are we safe in this building? Do mm -hmm. we need to move? Can we move? You know, do we call for help? Do we not? Do we have enough rations to stay here? Like, he does a really good job of catching that. And that is very different than the beginning part, where it's, you know, hey, look at this, you know, this douchebag. Make fun of this fat guy. And, like, that's the whole first part of the movie, <laughs> where he makes fun of the fat guy, or he makes fun of the guy with the glasses, or he makes fun of the Texan, you know, where there's only two things for Texas, steers and queers. You don't look like a deer. And it's like, yeah. It's weird. A lot of people hate that. A lot of people hate the giant shift. And I, I think it can work for a movie, and I think it does for this one. I don't know. Uh, you've never seen it. I'm asking for your opinion. You've never seen it. So, totally unrelated note. Have you ever read The Red Badge of Courage? No, I've heard of it. I hate that book. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> like, I think it's the... It's the American Civil War, maybe? The... It, anyway, it's it was written by a guy who had never seen a battle in his entire life, which that right. part I don't really mind. But none of the characters have names in the book. It's always... The young soldier, the oh. old soldier, the tall soldier, the other tall soldier. Tall soldier number three. I hated that book. I'm sorry. Anyway, unrelated, sorry. But speaking of movies that have, you know, giant tonal shifts, one of the best examples that I can think of that really, really nails the giant tonal shift in the middle of the film is Hot Fuzz. Yes. So it's part of the Cornello trilogy. There was Shaun of the Dead. There was the Hot one. Fuzz. And then there was At World's End. Yeah, The World's the, End. The World's End. At World's End is the Pirates of the Caribbean yes. movie. Okay. That movie's great. <laughs> no. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, but my friend Josh, who I've mentioned on the podcast before, he really likes that movie. Because oh, no. He fell asleep in the middle of it, and when he woke up, they were in a giant whirlpool. And he was like, oh, this movie's awesome, because he's he only missed, seen like 15 he minutes of it. the whole middle shit with the ship and the <laughs> sand, and the we have to flip the boat upside down, Jack. The fuck does that mean? Oh, oh the movie's rough. The movie's terrible. <laughs> but uh, bo both of the sequels are just... All three of the sequels. Oh, right, the fourth one. You fell asleep I during fell asleep the during that one. one. It's like the only movie that I've ever fallen asleep in in the theater. I woke up and there was like zombie mermaids. And I was yeah. like, oh, this, this I remember because me and other Justin were sitting there and it was storming outside. And we were like crossing our fingers that the power was going to go out and we get our money back. <laughs> it was, uh, that movie was rough. Yeah. Um, so Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz, for those of you who haven't seen it, oh, it's it's such a great movie. It I really highly, is. highly recommend. So the beginning of the movie, Nicholas Angel, Simon Pegg's character, he's like this super cop. He's like yeah. this decorated, you know, cop from London who has an amazing arrest rate and his paperwork is always perfect and he stops all these crimes and he ends up getting told, hey, you're you're too good at your job and you're making the rest of us look bad. So he gets sent to like this 
out in small, the country, out in the country village. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it doesn't matter. Anyway. Yorkshire. <laughs> sure, whatever. So he ends up going into this police force in this kind of like quaint little village that's on, you know, it's like a little mountain village type right. thing where, where he meets Nicholas Frost's character, who's kind of just this like doofy, like Chief Wiggum style, yes. like just, just police officer who, you know, he's just... He's always eating ice cream, and he, he's really, really fumbly. And everybody's kind of a buffoon in that police force. Except for the suave captain. Yes, except for the suave captain. But the movie starts out, and it's it's clearly a comedy. Like, it's it's directed by Edgar Wright. And I yeah. think it's it, it's it's definitely my favorite of his films. I would agree. It's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's the strongest of the trilogy. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's really the pinnacle of... Edgar Wright comedy and Edgar Wright, you know, editing and filmmaking. Because we've talked before about how just just in the way he edits scenes, he produces comedy. Yeah. You know, in a great example is the very beginning of Hot Fuzz where Simon Pegg's character is on the train. And the way that he uses editing, just he creates jokes out of camera angles. And it's so perfect. He's such such a talented director. I can't can't say enough about it. But so this movie starts out and it's kind of like this this offbeat comedy about, you know, this this super cop paired with this doofy bumbling guy. Right. In and this perfect little hometown. Yeah, in this perfect village. town where there's never any crime. Right. You know, N Nicholas Angel, he's like, Oh, this is just so boring. Nothing ever happens here. What am I do? But he's still like very, very serious. You know, he's sitting on the side of the road with his speed gun. And, you know, he pulls people over because they're going, you know, three miles over. And he just, he's very, very serious about what he does. Right. And everybody's like, oh, you got to lighten up. You got to relax. And just as he kind of starts to get comfortable and relax, people start dying. Right. And, or just straight up vanishing. Yeah, or disappearing. And, like, nobody has gone missing or died in this village in years and years and years. And all of a sudden, there's these brutal murders that start happening. Right. The movie does a really good job earlier on of showing how Nicholas Fro Nick, how Nick Frost's character Nick loves Angel. movies. <laughs> Nick Nick, you said Nick Frost? Well, Nick Frost's character, right. who's the fat cop. Wait, we might want to... It's fine. I'm going to say Simon Pegg and Nicholas from Nick Frost from now on. Because <laughs> like... I don't remember Nick Frost's name in the movie. But anyway, so Nick Frost's character, he loves movies like Bad Boys 2. Yeah. And um, he wants to be the Point hero Break. Cop. Yeah, he wants to be the hero cop because he loves all of these... 80s 90s early 2000s like buddy cop action movies like that's right. his idea they go to his house and you know he has this huge dvd collection and so uh nick frost and simon Pegg like start watching these movies and nick frost is like oh how look how awesome bad boys 2 is and simon Pegg's like i don't know what you see in these movies but they get drunk and they bond and they have a good time right but slowly the mystery starts to build and like there's the kids that are that are in the there's, pub. Like, I was gonna say there's the kids that spray paint. Yes. And they, they vanish, they're gone. There's the couple that speeds, they're gone. Yes. So people people start to disappear right. and then people start to straight up get killed. They're they're being murdered. Well the best thing is they keep on playing it off like it's a it's an accident. Right. Oh what a horrible accident. What a horrible accident. Like, like my, my favorite one is someone falls onto like like shears or something. Yes. And it's like, huh, must have slipped. Yeah. It's, it's like terrible. Just, there's no possible way this would be an accident. So pe people people are dying and going missing. And oh, you get oh, it's one of my favorites. You get Timothy Dalton as yes. this completely smug asshole who owns like a like a Walmart style chain of yeah. of convenience stores. And there's that there's that great shot where Timothy Dalton he smiles, and there's the picture behind him of him also smiling in the same pose. It's oh, Edgar it's Wright. totally fake. You it's God, you're just so amazing. So anyway, towards the end of the movie, the movie kind of becomes one of these cheesy over-the-top action movies that it spent the whole time making fun of yes because and again watch this movie if you haven't already so spoilers it's on netflix yes at the end of the movie it turns out that all these people are going missing or all these people are dying because the village is participating in this like best village competition yeah. for some magazine or something like that and they're systematically killing people who you know, don't take care of the garden outside their house. Right, or speed. Or speed. Or vandalize. Or, yeah, or... or just anybody who is causing their town not to be the most perfect village that there ever was, 
they're killing these people. Right. They're they're kidnapping them. They're, they're making them disappear. Them for the greater good. The greater good. And it turns out it's this big conspiracy of all the town council and <laughs> they're even in like they're even like hoods. Yeah, they're even they're in like, like black hoods. robes meeting in the forest. Right. And like this like almost like a what is it? Stonehenge. Like they're yes. like a Stonehenge ruin. Exactly, exactly. And but it works because the entire movie has it's been funny. But there's been this kind of like undercurrent of this mystery. And right. then when the movie, the movie has the huge tonal shift, it flips on its head. And now it becomes this crazy over the top action movie That's where, amazing. you know, the police force, they have to go into the town and like the, there's like the doctor and he's just like, oh, hey, how you doing? He pulls out his umbrella and he's got a gun inside right. of like it. like the woman with the cane. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Like a shotgun. Yeah. And they go into the convenience store and there's the huge shootout and there's the big, tall Frankenstein guy who's like, mm -hmm. yarp, which that's the hound, by the way, from yep. Game of Thrones. You know, and he like there's a big fight and they they're like using groceries and hitting each other with them and bullets are flying everywhere and and he not he knocks out Nick uh Simon Pegg knocks out the big guy and he, he goes into the freezer and then he comes around the corner and he's like, I, I knocked him out and I got him in the freezer and Nick Frost goes, Did you did you say a line? Did you say a line? Like chill out or Simon Pegg's like, No, no, I didn't. I just I just kinda of walked away. And it just it plays on the tropes. Right. It's it's a movie that very much recognizes that it is a parody of these cheesy, over-the-top action movies, but it fully embraces yeah. those tropes and those cliches. In a way that mocks it, but also kind of celebrates it at yeah, the same time. Yeah, it's, it's kind of similar to what Tarantino tends to do in his movies, where he takes these tropes of these genre movies that he watched as a kid, and he kind of presents them, but he presents them in a slightly different angle like a cynical sarcastic way yeah but but where you can also tell that he really loves right. the source material and hot fuzz does the same thing all, all three of the cornello trilogy really do this but hot fuzz i think better than the other two really establishes the idea that clearly edgar wright knows these ch cheesy action movies and he he loves them and he appreciates them right and that's how he can kind of take the tropes and flip it on their head so the movie devolves into like this crazy conspiracy action flick and it just, it super works. The shift that, you know, what happens at the beginning of the movie versus what's happening at the end of the movie, it's completely different. Like it's a, right. it's a, you wouldn't see it coming at all. Yeah, it's a total change of tone and atmosphere. But because of the groundwork that Edgar Wright has laid throughout the entire film, when you get to the end or when you get to that flipping point, it just, you're sold. It really works. Right. And you buy into it. And you're not, you know, you don't get, you're not, you don't sneer. And you're not like, oh, what, what happened here? It, or go it, back to the nice stuff. He, right, he totally nails it. He lays the breadcrumbs as the movie goes on, and so when the twist happens, you're like, all right, I'm in for this. Right. It's it, it's my favorite. It is. It is really, really good. Rumor has it, it completely accurately depicts a policeman's job. Yeah. It, where 90% of it is paperwork. Yeah, filling out paperwork. Stamping and, papers, writing out like, yes. letters. And he builds comedy into that. Like Right, where it's like playing like the intensive music, where it's like... Phew, yeah, it's the intense sound it's effects like, and the it intense it's like music, but it's stuff. just like him writing, filling out paperwork and like stamping like things. Like an envelope yeah, and closing it. Exactly. It it really, again, really, really effectively plays on those tropes and plays on those cliches, flips them on their head, makes comedy out of it, and yeah. really makes this parody of action movies into this great, great film. So now on to shit. <laughs> now is the part where we uh, we talk about what what doesn't work? Let's right. let's think of let's think of an example. Yeah, let's think of a big example. <laughs> let's think of about a six hour example over the of, course of three releases of really where tone kind of goes awry. Right. We could do well, we could do the Matrix trilogy, but that's that's got one good and two bad. But <laughs> so we could do a long time ago. Oh, in a galaxy far far away. Oh, we're gonna do Return of the Jedi, but that not that far away or oh, not that long ago. Not the eighties. There was the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Jesus. We're going to talk about why in one aspect, because there's lots of aspects, but this one variable being tone, why these three movies fail right. so hard. Go ahead. So we'll start with Revenge of the Sith, which wow, is... Wow, backwards. Yeah, sure. Why not? Which... <laughs> I think is the least bad of the three. It is. It's not an excuse. It's, and it's not, not a good. Thing. It's not good. It's not a good movie. It's but it's certainly terrible. the least terrible of the three. Okay, so I would I would argue that that Revenge of the Sith at least tells a story. It's just terrible. It tells it poorly, and the the tone <laughs> as we're about to get into is terrible. 
but it it tells a story right. at least. So let me set the stage for you real quick. We sure. had two movies that people had complained about were too lighthearted as opposed to four and five, which were kind of for adults, but still enough for children. They weren't, you know, too R rated or anything like that. There was a balance. Right. There was a really good balance. Again, you could I- show it to your children, but not like cover their eyes and see. Right. And it was it was kind of going back to those old school like you know, 1930s serials a la like Flash Gordon right. or that sort of thing. Or the where, Batman. Yeah. Where it's this it's this action adventure science fiction fantasy. It's accessible enough for kids, but it's not so silly that adults can't appreciate it. Right, because it's the classic hero villain storyline. Yes. The, um, the archetypes are there. Right. The giant empire with the small rebellion. Like mm-hmm. it's classic. So the first two movies get berated for how childish they are. Mostly because of a giant CG rabbit, <laughs> who is somehow not in two, but still blamed for two. Hayden Christensen? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Andrew Gunray. Uh, Which, to I, to Hayden Christensen's credit, nope. he's probably an okay <laughs> actor, but the scripts of these movies give see, him... Did me- you see Jumper? Uh, I did. <laughs> hey, man, we, guys gotta get a paycheck. We watched it together. We did watch it together. <laughs> it was no good. Kristen Stewart shows up in the end, though, which was weird. For like five seconds. Yeah, it's like... Hi, is your mom home? And she's like, yeah, hold on. And she leaves the movie. Here's $20,000. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. We'll see you in Twilight. All right. So Revenge of the Sith. So the first two movies are seen as more childish. So people are saying, why well, let's, you know, give us, give us adults a Star Wars movie. So what Lucas did is he went over to his TV and he turned the pitch down. <laughs> and the movie, his answer to, well, you don't like the childish? Well, I'm going to be really dark. And it, she's, it's like dark but it's like the gothic kid in middle school dark <laughs> it's you know yeah it's very it's very like pseudo serious it's, it's the very pseudo like, gritty to suicide silence and goes like <laughs> my parents hate me well he pulls out his like iphone 6 you know <laughs> uh but it's just it doesn't it doesn't earn it at all like no the first two films still exist you can't just jump the tone this quickly and make it this dark serious gritty film it doesn't work we know that Hayden Christian's a whiny bitch, and we know that Obi Wan Kenobi's a drunk idiot. Like <laughs> these two don't work. Right, I agree. And we'll the, there's the darkness factor, but there's also just like so at the very very beginning of the movie, and this is a problem with all three movies. I think we get Obi Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker, and they're in the middle of this really intense space battle. Right. Which, but, by the way, real quick, that is not a one shot. <laughs> it doesn't count. Stop pointing out the fact that the opening of Revenge of the Sith is a one shot. It's, it's not. not. But we get this right off the bat. They're just like, oh, yep, it's another battle. We're not worried about anything. Right. Well, look at us. We're Jedi. And this is a big problem with all three movies is that we open with this super intense space battle. And then it's immediately undercut by the fact that they could not give two shits less right. about what's going on. You know, they land and they jump out of the ship and they lightsaber the drawer and they're just like, with oh, no, yeah. with and no it, effort. It, right. And then just like smack their hands, like rubbing off the dirt. Like, oh, that was that was easy. There's no tension right. at all. Well, and then they go up and we, we find the villain from the second movie who beats them and leaves our heroes defeated. Right. And they just get rid of them. They just dispose of them with, like, yeah, like no problem. 15 seconds. Right. And, like, it's just... And then Hayden Christensen kills him. He beheads him. Where did this he, come from? Yeah, he literally cuts his head off. Right. Like, where did this come from? We don't have anything leading up to this. Right. And it, I, it goes back to the idea that I think Lucas was pressured to darken the tone for adults and make this into a more, you know, young adult adult film. And it just, it doesn't work when you have shit like Jar Jar Binks <laughs> or when you have C-3PO or Newt Gunray, for God's sake, on Mustafar going, oh, what's going on? As Anakin, like, be- like destroys him. Newt Gunray, greatest Star Wars character Amazing. of all time. <laughs> Best character. But it just, you, you can put scenes side by side, right? You have, like, there is a wonderful scene in this movie where Anakin gets back after that fight and Padme's standing there off to the side and he comes over and she says, Anakin, we're pregnant. And, like, hey, to your, to your benefit with Hayden Christensen's defense, like, the emotions in his face yes. are, like, you know, oh, great. Oh, shit. Oh, yes. great. Like, it's like this wave hits in him. That, in that, yeah, in that one scene, just just the amount of acting he does, like, in his eyes and his mouth and it just his, his, like, tone of speech... He has this wave of excitement, and then he has then he has this wave of worry, right? And then he has this way of like he has to put on a strong face for her, right? Because like, she's going to be going through a lot of crap too. Exactly, like she's going to be going through as much emotional turmoil, if not more so, than he is. And that because queens can't love. That, and then that twenty seconds, 
you get this, oh, like these are human beings. Like right. these are people as opposed to just the the absolute blocks of wood that we get throughout most of the prequel trilogy. And again, it's a lot of it is the scripting. A lot of it is the yes. direction. Like it's not their fault. But there's that moment of these are actual human beings. And again, it's the little sapperling and the giant concrete slab of shit that's on top of it. Yep. It's it's a moment. Yes. And it's there. But then there's scenes following that where it's like uh, he cuts off Mace Windu's hands and they shove, like, shove him out the window. Or the part where he walks into the, the room and the yeah. little kids come out and they're like, Master Skywalker! And he's like, alright, I'm going to kill all of you now. And that moment could be effective. And I don't, If I don't, it built to it. Again, going back to like the Mace Windu thing that you just said, Palpatine, when he's like using the Force Lightning, he's just like, now, nah. It's like super like cartoony right. and like over the top and just doesn't make any sense. He's a mustache twirler. Like look, look back to the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. He's just very, he's very calm and collected the entire time. And in this movie, he's just like, right. he's just like, like this. Now. Yeah, he's just like, now. again, he's just like a cartoony villain and it just doesn't it doesn't work well, and then he man. starts hopping around and fighting yoda and then uh, it's like he's gone he's not a real person anymore yeah so you're trying to turn like this would be like making a dark version of like a disney cartoon mm -hmm. it doesn't work and you can't have both yeah you, you can't you, entertain you, children and make this flashy sci-fi shit fest right while still trying to have emotional scenes like the i'm pregnant scene yes. or the scene where he walks in the room full of younglings and is like I have to end the Jedi thing right here. There should have been a lot more emotion in that, and yeah. it's not. And the, it the, doesn't earn its tone. It does not. And the the juxtaposition is is super super jarring. Like going back to like the Phantom Menace, for example, the final battle. You know, we're cutting back and forth between Obi Wan and Qui Gon fighting Darth Maul. Right. And we're cutting back to Anakin flying the Naboo Starfighter. And we're cutting back to, to Jar Jar Binks and the and Battle of the Gungans. To, and then also we're cutting back to Padme and Padme raiding the mansion. Exactly. So. There's, there's a lot going on, whereas like in Return of the Jedi, you have Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader with the Emperor, and then you right. have the battle going on outside between the ships, and then you have the battle, the battle on, on Endor. Endor. So yep. again, there's, there's multiple things going on, but in a general sense, in Jedi, those three scenes are basically on the same side of the spectrum as far as tone. Right. Like the scene in the throne room with Luke and Vader and the Emperor is a little bit darker and a little bit more subdued because right. the Luke emperor is being tortured. Yeah, and well, and even before that, the emperor is explaining like your friends will die. Like right. your friends don't he's, have a chance. He's trying to convince them, you know, this is your last chance. Right. Join us. Let's do this. And then in the space battle, like Lando and everyone else, they're they're trying to get into the Death Star and take it out. So like Wedge and Lando the battle is dire because the shields are still up and then on and Endor, like, yeah, Han gets, you know, Han and Leia and Chewbacca and C-3PO and everybody, they get captured by the reinforcements. So all of these scenes, even though they're slightly different, they're all kind of playing at the same rhythm as far as the situation that our heroes are in. Right, they're all low points. Like, exactly. everything's going down. And then as, as things crescendo, as... Han and Leia finally take down the shield generator, and as right. Lando and Wedge finally get into the innards of the Death Star... Vader has his change of heart. Yes. All of those scenes are kind of going on the uptick, and so there's a rhythm, there's a flow to what we're watching. Right. Whereas in Phantom Menace, we, and this is, this is perfectly illustrated by, there's a behind-the-scenes documentary about the making of the Phantom Menace, which I highly recommend anybody who's interested in it Absolutely. should watch. It's, it's available on YouTube. I don't remember the name of it, but if you just type behind-the-scenes... Star Wars Episode One. Also, you'll find at, it while you're at it. Go watch the Jake Lloyd audition tape and see the kid that oh actually my played Anakin. Oh my god! Oh, it's so it's so rough. It makes so, me so mad. Yeah. So like, <laughs> they, there's like Jake Lloyd and there's the other kid. And again, Jake Lloyd, he was a young kid. Like, I don't hold He's anything not against him. Now. Who cares? What a, <laughs> poor guy. But anyway, I don't hold anything against him. But like, yes, in that, that documentary, so when that other kid, you're just like, oh, that kid's great. Because it's like, I'm gonna be a pilot and I'm gonna fly away from here. Yeah. And like Jake Lloyd's like. I'm gonna be a pilot. I'm gonna fly away. Right, the kid is just the so natural, it, and you feel like like you feel you like this is a young hero, right? You believe him. You believe him. So anyway, in this in this documentary, there's a part where Lucas, Rick McCollum, the executive producer on the film, and Ben Burt, the sound, the lead sound design guy, they're all in a room and they're watching a rough cut of the movie, right? And it cuts, and as the lights come up, and it cuts back to Ben Burt, and he looks at Lucas, and he's like, "In the span of thirty seconds, you have." Qui-Gon getting killed, and then you cut back to Anakin, who's all excited because he's, he's, 
Woo! Right, and he's flying around. This is pod racing. It's it's not pod racing. Nope, you're that's flying a, a ship. Starfighter. <laughs> you're in space. But, so you get this you get this huge contrast and this huge shift of the tone and the emotions that you're expecting the audience to feel. Right. And it's it's this roller coaster ride, but not in a good way. It's not exciting. It's jarring. Yeah, we get no time to react to quiet. Yes. And this is this is something that persists throughout the entire prequel trilogy is that you go from these moments of impact and these moments of you you should feel this like kind of reverence for what's happening you know Qui-Gon is is getting killed or Anakin and Obi-Wan lose the battle against uh Dooku Count Dooku or you get this this Anakin and Obi-Wan are having this climactic battle and dance the, fight yeah the dance fight and you get these moments but then they cut back to these other moments where you're supposed to feel a completely different emotion and you're just, you're not in the flow. You're not in the rhythm right. that you were in Return of the Jedi. You're not in the rhythm where you're carrying the same emotion from scene to scene and that emotion is building and getting stronger and stronger so that when the turn finally happens, you feel this wave, this euphoria of relief or of happiness because the good guys are winning. The heroes are saving the yep. day. And you just don't get that in the prequels. And that the, again, it's that's why tone is so important is because you are establishing an atmosphere. You know, at the end of the day, you need the audience to feel the emotion that you want them to feel. Right. That's why we watch movies. That's right. why we love stories, is because we want to connect with these characters. And we can't we can't feel something when you you know, rip us out of one thing and throw us into yeah, another. You haven't, like you said earlier, and I've I say this over and over again in all these podcasts. You have to earn the changes that you make. Right. You have to earn the emotions that you want the audience to feel. You have to give the audience the tools to comprehend and to have the empathy necessary to make those emotional moments impactful and to evoke the response from the audience that you want. Almost universally, the prequel trilogies fail. Absolutely. At every moment. Absolutely. And... Two is not off the chain here. No. Two is a love story, a really shitty one oh. at one point. And then I just look at the ones. There's one scene in two that should be like the centerpiece of our discussion. And I that think, is. I think we're thinking the same the thing. The sand people. Yes. Like, how can he, Anakin, be professing his like his emotions for Padme and his mother and be like, I gotta go find my mom. Now my mom's gone. I'm gonna go murder a whole bunch of yes. people, come back and be like, I killed them. And then she just hugs him and it's like, it's okay, dude. We're all right. It's too. It's yes. You, you, that's perfect. Like it's too tangled. The movie, the storyline wants us to see that Anakin and Padme are falling in love, and what I'll even hand the fact that it's a forbidden love to them. Nope, that's garbage. But Go even if it. even if we hand that to them, it's this forbidden love, and they have these feelings for each other. And again, even if we ignore the fact that there's the age difference, and they had very little connection in the first movie, right? Let's give them the fact that these two characters are falling in love. Then you entangle it with Anakin's feelings about his mother being tortured and being dead and his anger where he murders the Tusken Raiders. He slaughters them like animals, as he says. Women and then, children, too. And then, but then Obi-Wan's holding him back. Obi-Wan won't let him become the Jedi that he wants right. to be. Like, no. There's so much going That's on here. That's not the here. conversation we're having. Yes. Like, you could, you could take these three concepts and you could make them work individually or you could interweave them in such a way where it makes sense and we're carrying through one emotion anakin could feel frustration that obi-wan is not letting him be the jedi he that frustration wants to be. could make him on edge which when he finds out that his mother's gone it could right. cause him to react you, in the way he does again you could you could take one emotion or one trait and have a beeline through all these events but that's not what they do they, nope. they jumble it all over the place so where we as the audience don't give a shit about Anakin and Padme because one, the movie hasn't shown us anything to give us any reason to believe that these characters have any true feelings for each other Right? because there's zero chemistry. And again, that's not the actor's fault. The script it's is garbage. They, they don't establish the mother enough in the second film to make the weight of her death impactful to the audience. Right. And they also don't, again, like in the first movie, yeah, it's a little kid, he's being separated from his mother, but it's not It's not this super emotional or traumatic thing where he's separated from, from his mom in the first film. 
Like, that's weak enough as it is in the first movie, so it certainly won't carry the emotion over to the second film. Right. I mean, even Ben's death in 4, we don't get a ton of clarity on who Ben is, but we get enough to know that he's supposed to be the man that's going to lead Luke through his training and his life. We understand why Ben Kenobi is important to Luke Skywalker. Right. So when Ben Kenobi dies, we feel that. We feel we that feel emotion. We feel Luke. Yes. Because we don't need to know him that much, as much as we just need to know that he means a lot to Luke. And it's strong enough to carry over into the second film, because we get a little bit of Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, you must go to the Dagobah system, Yoda's training, that Yoda. sort of thing, and it carries over into Return of the Jedi. Like, we understand why this character is valuable to Luke Skywalker. I get that Shmi is Anakin's mother, right? but she's not represented enough, and the movie is just so jumbled with his feelings towards Obi-Wan, and his feelings towards Padme, and his feelings towards the rest of the Jedi Council, and the fact that he's denied being a Jedi Master. Yeah, it's just, it's so jumbled, and it's such a mess that we don't care about any of these through lines through the film, and again, it just carries over to Revenge of the Sith, and I know I'm rambling at this point, but just... There's so many problems with these movies. Right. And tone... Tone is just one of very, very many. It is, but it's a major it one. It is. Because... And the, the tone is affected by all of the other elements, like the script writing and the acting and the dialogue. Like, the tone is, you know, negatively affected by all of those variables. Because well, we could even talk about... We could even go more into the first movie with how we have intense scenes with, you know, seizing the castle, you know, storming the Trade Federation yes. ships fighting Darth Maul. Jar Jar Binks right. is tripping over energy Right, orbs. Jar Jar Binks is fumbling around and like he's accidentally like, stumbling. He's like a Mr. Magoo character where like right. everything is working out it. around him. It ruins it. There's no, there's no risks in that scene. Yeah, and then Anakin's like, woohoo, I'm flying my ship. And then it cuts back and like, Liam Neeson is dead. Right. He's, he's been killed by the he fucking takes the devil. He the saber like, into the face and then through the chest. Jeez, like just, there's no, there's no, and Obi-Wan arguably is the character that we feel the most for in episode one, even though we we don't. Which, if you haven't, check out Belated Media's What If Star Wars Episodes 1, 2, and 3 Were Good. A very good example of how if you made Obi-Wan Kenobi the main character in those prequel movies, how much more effective those movies could have been. Or the Red Letter Media joke, where it's like, you should have just taken the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn and combined them to make one character. Yes. Obi-Wan Kenobi. (laughs) I've talked a whole, whole, whole lot about this, but the idea is that, and these movies are prime examples of, if you don't establish a tone at the beginning of the movie, right, and you don't have that tone be consistent, unless you have the ability to change it because you've breadcrumbed that in, a la Hot Fuzz or a la Full Metal Metal Jacket, Jacket. your audience isn't going to stay with you. Your audience isn't going to care about your world, about your characters, about your story, because there's no consistency. There's no reason for them to be invested in the events that are happening because you yourself have not invested the time and the care to make the story worth caring about. Right. Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> Thanks, George Lucas. Thanks, George. Ah. Uh, Why won't he mess with those? Why does he have to mess with the originals? I don't know. Well, he they did mess. They did like the 3D and they did a few things where they like inserted more shots. But well, I think Yoda now in the first one is CG instead of being the awkward Jim Henson puppet. Yes, yes. Not Jim Henson. Well, yeah, but even like the the Frank Oz pop (laughs) puppet. Mary Poppins. The Frank Oz puppet, you know, in those original movies, is so so good because you Yoda's a real thing. Like you, you. feel it you really feel it's, he's not sitting on a freaking hover chair no it's not a puppet man it's 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 a living breathing thing yeah. very much like et you know et was a e. living terrifying. breathing character and you you really felt for him he has no fucking dialogue other than you know et, e. e. phone home. home and i'll be right or here ouch. but but it just works spielberg sells it frank oz sells yoda in empire and return of the jedi right and yeah, I'm not sold on Ewan McGregor or Liam Neeson or, no, or, like no, or Natalie McGregor, Portman. Ewan McGregor You're, is the best part of that trilogy. He is, he is. And it's not very good. And it's not good. Like, But he's he's bringing so much to that role just because he studied Alec Guinness. And like yeah. Alec Guinness, the way that he talked and his affectations and his speech patterns, that alone brings so much but again, it's the it's small sapperling crawling out from the concrete slab of shit that's piled on top of it. Yep. 
We don't like the prequel movies. No one does. <laughs> don't defend them. They're garbage movie for garbage people. Yes, and those of you who are defending them and saying they weren't that bad after seven, shut up. You're wrong. Wrong. You're just wrong. Get out of here. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Yes. Three is not that great. By no. the way, hello, Matt K. I told him I would tell him hello because he listens. <laughs> we'll say, how about hello, Matt K? Hello, Matt K. There you go. You know who you are. <laughs> you put that in anywhere. That's, That's fine. I'll put it halfway through a sentence. <laughs> put it. So the next one, hello, Matt K. The next one we're going to talk about. Oh, also, also Matt K. Temple of Doom is way better than the fourth Indiana Jones movie. Fuck you Yay! for thinking differently. Had... You told me once in my home that Crystal Skull <laughs> was better than Temple of Doom. You, sir, are wrong. You are factually, actually wrong. I am sorry, but your opinion on Indiana Jones movies is incorrect. And Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, Dark Knight Rises is also terrible. And Revenge of the Sith. So the, the last five minutes of this podcast has just become, these are movies that fucking suck, right. and you're wrong if you think otherwise. Matt K. <laughs> oh, man. So thank oh. you so much for listening. We, I can check that off my list of things I have to do in this podcast. We hope you enjoyed our rants and ravings. But, again, to kind of take it back for a second, tone is super important. Yes. Tone and atmosphere that you establish in your movie is super important because it, it lets your audience know, hey, this is what you should expect from the next hour and a half, two hours of your experience, and that's important. Right. Without tone, you don't have a story. Yeah. Your movie doesn't have to be perfect. Red Letter Media recently did a review on the movie Tremors, and I don't know if you've ever seen Tremors. I have. Okay. I love Tremors. I think it's a great movie. It's very cheesy, but it, it, it kind of holds still. But it works. Yes. It, the, the, it establishes itself at the beginning of the movie of, hey, there's going to be some scary parts, but this is a comedy. It focuses on these two characters and their relationship and this right. small town. And it's a cheesy movie. Clearly, their budget made them creative with how they had to like show where the monster was, even though they couldn't show the monster. Right. Which is another thing I really like about that movie. Right, with like the use of puppets and miniatures. Yeah, and, and... From, from a technical standpoint and from a filmmaking standpoint, the movie's amazing. But that's a great movie because the beginning, in the first 10 minutes, you get a sense of like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what you expect. And the movie delivers. And it's fantastic. Right. It's not The Godfather. It's not Shawshank Redemption. But it doesn't have to be. It knows what it is. It knows what it is, and it completely succeeds in that. Right. Fantastic. And that's all thanks to tone. It's all thanks to the atmosphere that's established, the expectations that are set up at the beginning of the film, and the foom... And the foom. And the film is... Foom and shoom. <laughs> and the film is great. Yes, it is. It's very... It's very nostalgic at this point, too. Yes. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, like, Krampus, which just came out. Krampus has that same vibe. I still have to see that, but yeah, I've it, heard. It's got a very good vibe of, like, hey, the tone is it's Christmas, and, you know, it's kind of light and funny, but there's something horrible in the background, right. and, like, that's the, the right. tone of it. This is the movie you should expect, and that's the movie that they deliver. Yep, and it's very well done. Perfect. Absolutely. So thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion on tone and our rants on... Especially you, Matt Kay. On the, on the prequel trilogy. I'm sure it's not the last time we'll bring it up no, in this podcast. No, just like it won't be the last time we... Like, we, David Fincher's back to zero, so we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll yes. make a Star Wars board Zero too. Zero podcast since mentioning David Fincher. Yep. Um, so thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, or if there's anything that you'd like to let us know, you can reach the show on Facebook and Twitter and at Gmail, all at Pop Rant Radio. We're available on YouTube. You can download the show on Libsyn and on iTunes if you're listening on iTunes. As always, rate the show, get a review. It really does help us out. Yep. As always, would like to thank Major for the theme songs. Thank you, sir. You, man, are the man, as always. Man. <laughs> man. <laughs> and other than that, thank you so much for listening. We will see you next week where our topic will be something. We don't know yet. We never plan ahead. Legend of Tarzan. <laughs> it will uh, not be that. <laughs> uh, we'll figure it out. Pokemon. Sure. Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Go. I'm still not playing it. I'm putting it on your laptop right now. <laughs> so thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye.